Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Chapter Forty. Fishing, the Vigilance Committee, a lively run. Jim advises a doctor. We was feeling pretty good after breakfast and took my canoe and went over the river a fishing with a lunch and had a good time and took a look at the raft and found her all right and got home late to supper and found them in such a sweat and worry they didn't know which end was standing on and made us go right off to bed the minute we was done supper and wouldn't tell us what the trouble was and never let on a word about the new letter but didn't need to because we knowed as much about it as anybody did and as soon as we was half upstairs and her back was turned we slid for the cellar cupboard and loaded up a good lunch and took it up to our room and went to bed and got up about half past eleven and tom put on aunt sally's dress that he stole and was going to start with lunch but says where's the butter i laid out a hunk of it i says on a piece of corn pone well you left it laid out then it ain't here we can get along without it i says we can get along with it too he says just you slide down cellar and fetch it and then mosey right down the lightning rod and come along i'll go and stuff the straw into jim's clothes to represent his mother in disguise and be ready to ba like a sheep and shove soon as you get there so out he went and down cellar went i the hunk of butter, big as a person's fist, was where I had left it. So I took up the slab of corn pone with it on, and blowed out my light, and started upstairs very stealthy, and got up to the main floor all right. But here comes Aunt Sally with a candle, and I clapped the truck in my hat, and clapped my hat on my head, and the next second she see me, and she says, "'You been down cellar?' "'Yes, am "'What you been doing down there?' "'Nothing.' nothing no nope. well then what possessed you to go down there this time of night i don't know em. you don't know don't answer me that way tom i want to know what you would been doing down there i ain't been doing a single thing aunt sally i hope to gracious if i have i reckon she'd let me go now and as a general thing she would but i suppose there was so many strange things going on she was just in a sweat about every little thing that weren't yard stick straight so she says very decided you just march into that setting room and stay there till i come you've been up to something you know business to and i lay i'll find out what it is before i'm done with you so she went away as i opened the door and walked into the setting room my but there was a crowd there fifteen farmers and every one of them had a gun i was most powerful sick and slunk to a chair and sat down they was settin round some of them talkin a little in a low voice and all of them fidgety and uneasy and trying to look like they weren't but i knowed they was because they was always takin off their hats and puttin them on and scratchin their heads and changing their seats and fumbling with their buttons I weren't easy myself, but I didn't take my hat off all the same. I did wish Aunt Sally would come and get done with me and lick me if she wanted to and let me get away and tell Tom how we'd overdone this thing and what a thundering hornet's nest we'd got ourselves into so we could stop fooling around straight off and clear out with Jim before these rips got out of patience and come for us. At last she come and begun to ask me questions but I couldn't answer them straight. I didn't know which end of me was up, because these men was in such a fidget now that some was wanting to start right now and lay for them desperados, and saying it weren't but a few minutes to midnight, and others was trying to get them to hold on and wait for the sheep signal, and here was Auntie pegging away at the questions, and me a shaking all over and ready to sink down in my tracks I was that scared and the place getting hotter and hotter, and the butter beginning to melt and run down my neck and behind my ears. And pretty soon when one of them says, I'm for going and getting in the cabin first and right now and catching them when they come, I most dropped, and a streak of butter come a-trickling down my forehead. And Aunt Sally, she see it, and turns white as a sheet and says, for the land's sake, what is the matter with the child? 
he's got the brain fever as sure as you're born, and they're oozing out. And everybody runs to see, and she snatches off my hat, and out comes the bread and what was left of the butter, and she grabbed me and hugged me and says, Oh, what a turn you did give me, and how glad and grateful I am it ain't no worse, for luck's against us, and it never rains but it pours, and when I see that truck I thought we'd lost you, for I knowed by the color and all it was just like your brains would be if— <laughs> Dear, dear, why'd you tell me that was what you'd been down there for? I wouldn't a cared. Now clear out to bed, and, and don't let me see no more of you till morning. I was upstairs in a second, and down the lightning rod in another one, and shinning through the dark for the lean-to. I couldn't hardly get my words out, I was so anxious, but I told Tom as quick as I could we must jump for it now, and not a minute to lose. The house was full of men yonder with guns. His eyes just blazed, and he says, No, is that so? Ain't it bully? Why, Huck, if it was to do over again, I bet I could fetch two hundred. If we could put it off till— Hurry, hurry, I says. Where's Jim? Right at your elbow. If you reach out your arm, you can touch him. He's dressed, and everything's ready. Now we'll slide out and give the sheep signal. But then we heard the tramp of men coming to the door, and heard them begin to fumble with a padlock, and heard a man say, I told you we'd be too soon. They haven't come. The door is locked. Here, I'll lock some of you into the cabin, and you lay for em in the dark, and kill em when they come. And the rest scatter round a piece, and listen if you can hear em coming. So in they come, but couldn't see us in the dark, and most trod on us whilst we was hustling to get under the bed. But we got under all right, and out through the hole, swift but soft, Jim first, me next, and Tom last, which was according to Tom's orders. Now we was in the lean-to, and heard trampings close by outside. So we crept to the door, and Tom stopped us there, and put his eye to the crack, but couldn't make out nothing, it was so dark and whispered and said he would listen for the steps to get further, and when he nudged us, Jim must glide out first, and him last. So he set his ear to the crack, and listened, and listened, and listened, and the steps a scraping round out there all the time, and at last he nudged us, and we slid out, and stooped down, not breathing, and not making the least noise and slipped stealthy towards the fence in engine file, and got to it all right, and me and Jim over it, but Tom's breeches catched fast on a splinter on the top rail, and then he hear the steps coming, so he had to pull loose, which snapped the splinter and made a noise, and as he dropped in our tracks and started, somebody sings out, "'Who's that? Answer or I'll shoot!' But we didn't answer. We just unfurled our heels and shoved, then there was a rush and a bang, 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 and the bullets fairly whizzed around us. We heard them sing out, Here they are! They've broke for the river! After them, boys, and turn loose the dogs! So here they come, full tilt. We could hear them because they wore boots and yelled, but we didn't wear no boots and didn't yell. We was in the path to the mill, and when they got pretty close on to us, we dodged into the bush and let them go by and then dropped in behind them. They'd had all the dogs shut up, so they wouldn't scare off the robbers, but by this time somebody had let them loose, and here they come, making pow-wow enough for a million. But they was our dogs. So we stopped in our tracks till they catched up, and when they see it weren't nobody but us, and no excitement to offer them, they only just said howdy and tore right ahead towards the shouting and clattering, and then we up steam again and whizzed along after them till we was nearly to the mill, and then struck up through the bush to where my canoe was tied, and hopped in and pulled for dear life towards the middle of the river, but didn't make no more noise than we was obliged to. Then we struck out easy and comfortable for the island where my raft was, and we could hear them yelling and barking at each other all up and down the bank till we was so far away the sounds got dim and died out and when we stepped on to the raft i says now old jim you're a free man again and i bet you won't ever be a slave no more and a mighty good job it was too huck it is planned beautiful and it is done beautiful 
and dey ain't nobody can git up a plan dat's mo' mixed up and splendid dan what dat one was we was all glad as we could be but tom was the gladdest of all because he had a bullet in the calf of his leg when me and jim heard that we didn't feel so brash as what we did before it was hurting him considerable and bleeding so we laid him in the wigwam and tore up one of duke's shirts for to bandage him but he says give me the rags i can do it myself don't stop now don't fool around here and the evasion booming along so handsome man the sweeps and set her loose boys we done it elegant deed we did i wished we'd a hand the handling of louis the sixteenth there wouldn't have been no son of st louis ascend to heaven wrote down in his biography no sir we'd a whooped him over the border that's what we'd a done with him and done it just as slick as nothing at all too man the sweeps man the sweeps but me and jim was consulting and thinking and after we'd thought a minute i says say it jim so he says well then this is the way it looked to me huck if it was him dat is being sought free and one or two boys was to get shot would he say go on and save me never mind about a doctor for to save dis one is dat like mars tom sawyer would he say dat you bet he wouldn't well then is jim going to say it no sir i don't budge a step out of dis place doubt a doctor not if it's forty year i knowed he was white inside and i reckoned he'd say what he did say so it was all right now and i told tom i was a-going for a doctor he raised considerable row about it but me and jim stuck to it and wouldn't budge so he was for crawling out and setting the raft loose himself but we wouldn't let him then he give us a piece of his mind but it didn't do no good so when he sees me getting the canoe ready he says well then if you're bound to go i'll tell you the way to do when you get to the village shut the door and blindfold the doctor tight and fast and make him swear to be silent as the grave and put a purse full of gold in his hand and then take and lead him all around the back alleys and everywheres in the dark and then fetch him here in the canoe in a roundabout way amongst the islands and search him and take his chalk away from him and don't give it back to him till you get him back to the village or else he will chalk this raft so he can find it again it's the way they all do so i said i would and left and jim was to hide in the woods when he see the doctor coming till he was gone again End of chapter forty